Dark Woods Demon by Johnny and Elijah Henderson. Author's note, this story is based on actual events. Jacob cursed as he pushed through the thick underbrush trying to make his way to the tree stand he had built earlier in the summer. He was certain that this location would give him an optimal line of sight to the neighboring field in which he frequently saw large herds of deer. This was going to be his year, and he was sure of it. This is the year that I bring home my trophy buck, he thought, as he recalled the events of the day so far. He had awakened at 4.30 a.m. He began to prepare for the long day in the woods, on the backside of his farm. His first order of business had been to locate and rescue his gloves and camouflage hunting gear from whatever undisclosed area of his home that his wife had hidden them. He would most assuredly need them this morning to protect him from the bitter cold November morning. How could it be this cold this early in the year, he wondered as he started to work on his second task of the day, which was to prepare a breakfast that would stick to his ribs long enough into the day. He wasn't entirely sure what he wanted this morning, but he finally settled on toast, country ham, and scrambled eggs that were just a little too runny. He topped it all off with a large cup of coffee that left a bitter taste in his tongue. In fact, he could still taste it. After accomplishing task one and two, he packaged himself a bologna and cheese sandwich for lunch, grabbed his Remington 30 6 hunting rifle, a thermos of coffee, and headed out the door. He loaded his gear into his truck and pulled out into the driveway and turned right into the one-lane blacktop road that led to the backside of his property. After about two and a quarter miles, he turned right again off the blacktop onto a dirt road that was gouged with deep mud-filled ruts. He had traveled about another half mile down that pitiful rut-filled excuse for a road. When he came to his desired location, he got out of his truck and loaded his gun and sauntered off into the woods. Jacob had gone little more than 500 yards into the densely wooded tree line when he began to wish that he had put on an extra layer of clothing to shield him against the chilly morning air. Ten minutes out of the truck and he was already cold, and it was made worse by the cloudy, overcast day and the wind that was blowing steadily through the trees, making the autumn leaves rattle like dry bones. Oh well, he thought, it's going to be a good day anyways, especially if I bring home a big one. Jacob took about ten more steps with an uneasy feeling began to creep over him. He felt as though someone had stepped over his grave. He got a distinct feeling that he was being watched. But by whom? This was his property and it was posted. No one had permission to be on his land. He had to be alone. But if he was alone, why couldn't he shake the eerie feeling that was scratching at the base of his skull? Something was off today. There was a deafening silence there in the forest. No birds, or insects, only the sound of the wind in the trees. Convincing himself that it was nothing more than the case of nurse, he continued to press on until he came to a clearing not far from his tree stand. Stepping into the clearing, Jacob saw the remains of what appeared to be a large deer. He wasn't quite able to make out what he was seeing from the distance, because the sun wasn't completely up yet, and the forest was still enveloped in shadows. Jacob walked closer to get a better look, and found that he had been correct. It was a deer, a large eight-point buck, in fact. Looking at the remains, he felt a sense of dread come over him, and icy fingers dance along his spine. Something about this kill just doesn't seem right. The throat was completely torn out, and the stomach was ripped open. Plus, several of the internal organs were missing. It was the most grisly thing he'd ever seen. This definitely wasn't the coyote kill and no hunter would have done this. They would have taken the head to have it mounted. What could have done this, he wondered. A fear like nothing he'd ever experienced before began to wash over him in waves. What is going on, he thought. At nearly 225 pounds and well over six foot, he wasn't one to give in to fear. But now, he couldn't seem to calm down, and his heart was beating like a trip hammer. The feeling that he was being watched was getting stronger by the minute and he couldn't shake the feeling that he was moments away from a bad situation. He slowly started to back away from the mangled carcass and head back to his truck, and back to safety. No more than six steps into his journey, his blood turned to ice in his veins, as a deep, guttural, wailing scream shattered the eerie silence and what was left of his courage. He had grown up on the farm all his life and had been an experienced hunter since childhood. He was familiar with every animal in this part of the state. 
Not even a cougar, bobcat, or bear could have produced the scream that had torn through the early morning forest and filled him with such bone-chilling apprehension. Primal fear now gave way to stark terror as he chambered around into his 30 odd six and turned around only to find there was nothing behind him. His mind raced with confusion, and he was confronted with a million thoughts at once. What should I do? What could it be? Should I run? Am I going to die? His survival senses kicking into overdrive. Jacob decided to continue on his previously contrived plan, which was to go to the truck, and get out of there while the getting was good. Slowly and cautiously, he made his way towards the perceived salvation of his vehicle, silently praying every step of the way. With 300 yards separating him from his only avenue of escape, Jacob began to hear heavy footfalls off to his left. He could hear the crunching of withered leaves, sticks, and debris that littered the forest floor. Summoning every ounce of courage that remained within him, he forced himself to look to that direction. And that's when he saw the dark silhouette that followed him through the densely tangled forest. Quickening his pace, he redoubled his efforts to reach the truck and get to a phone and call the sheriff, the game warden, or anyone that would listen. He couldn't tell what it was that was stalking him, but he could clearly see that it towered more than seven feet and was incredibly massive. Jacob couldn't help but think that he was about to become a national statistic, a person who left home under normal circumstances and just disappeared without a trace. How many people, he wondered, go into the woods and just vanish? and the authorities just assumed that he'd just become lost or injured, or even become the victim of animal attacks, with their bodies never being recovered. Please, God, don't let this happen to me, he thought, as he drew closer and closer to his truck. 75 yards became 50, and 50 became 30, and 30 became 10. Like a miracle, he was back and opening his door. Throwing his rifle inside, he pulled himself up into the cab and started the engine and hit the gas but the truck went nowhere. He had parked in a large mud puddle, and now the tires simply spun, slinging mud 30 feet behind him. Oh no, not now, he thought. I can't be stuck, not now! Allowing himself a moment to think, Jacob remembered that his truck is a four-wheel drive. There's no way it can be stuck. Reaching down, he locked his truck into four-wheel drive and was prepared to punch the gas and leave the slammer behind. Unfortunately for Jacob, some nightmares are not so easily left behind, and there's nothing worse than a nightmare you can't wake from, and Jacob was about to learn that the hard way. Hearing something to his right, he instinctively turned and immediately wished that he had not. It took him maybe half a second to turn his head, but he would have given anything in the world to have that half second back, because it was the last moment that his world would ever seem normal again. In that split second, his world changed. It was no longer a place where the world was light and safe, where he was just a husband and a father, and a guy that liked to hunt and watch football on the weekends. That reality had evaporated away like the early morning fog, and all that was left was a world where monsters existed, and things really went bump in the night. And now, an ambassador from that nightmare realm was just standing outside his passenger door, a visible reminder that his world had been turned upside down. Jacob screamed as he stared, transfixed on this escapee from a horror movie, and the most terrifying, fevered dream he could ever imagined that such thing could ever exist. It was hideously ugly, standing eight feet tall with a thick, muscular body. It looked very apish in appearance, but then again, it didn't. There was just something about the face that was just wrong, almost like an obscene amalgamation of man and animal that had gone horribly array. It was the most terrifying thing he'd ever seen. It was completely covered with thick, shaggy black hair that was matted in areas with God only knows what, and it walked on two legs, not four like you would expect from some kind of animal. What was this thing that had shattered his perception of reality? Was it a demon? A werewolf? It can't be, he thought. Those things don't exist. Maybe it was some kind of reject from the island of Dr. Moreau. Whatever it was, it was staring at him, and it didn't look happy. The menacing juggernaut threw its enormous head back and let out a blood-curdling scream, 
that resonated throughout the surrounding area and seemed to vibrate him to his very core. Shocked back into action, Jacob threw his truck into gear and took off as though he was being chased by the very hounds of hell. Jacob, mind racing, wondered what he was going to do. How will I ever feel safe on this farm again, he thought. Are my wife and children in danger? Where did this thing come from and will anyone believe me? The whirlwind of thoughts that swirled through Jacob's mind came to an immediate stop as he slammed on his brakes and nearly slid off the road. In a state of disbelief, Jacob sat staring at the large hackberry tree that laid across the dirt road and blocked his path, preventing him from reaching the blacktop in guaranteed safety. How is this even possible, he thought. I just came down this road not even 30 minutes ago, and the path was clear. However this tree came to be across the road, it was painfully obvious to Jacob that he had to get out and move the tree if he was going to make it home. Since he had neither chain to pull the tree out of the road, nor did he have a saw which he could cut out this unexpected barricade, he was left with few viable options, one of which was walking, which he discounted almost immediately. The most logical course of action that he could come up with was to call for help. His best friend Kenny Patterson owned the farm just over from his. If he were home, he could bring a saw and cut the tree up for him. Jacob, with his nerves still frazzled and frayed, reached into his glove box and pulled out his cell phone and clumsily dialed Kenny's number. The phone rang six times and Jacob was about to give up when Kenny answered the phone and said, Hey, ugly, what do you want this early in the morning? As quickly as he could, he related the recent events to Kenny and said, Man, please hurry. I'm not kidding, there's something out here. Kenny, hearing the shakiness in his friend's voice, assured him that he would be there in a matter of minutes. Jacob thanked him and hung up the phone, and braced himself for what he assured to be the longest few minutes of his life. Sitting there motionless with bated breath there in the truck, every sound made his imagination run with fear and expectance. Even though little more than three minutes had passed since he had spoken to Kenny, it felt as if hours had passed. Each tick of the clock seemed to be an eternity. Jacob frequently checked in all directions for any sign that that nightmarish monstrosity had pursued him. In every shadow that the forest and this irritatingly cloudy day produced, he thought he saw the shape of the black beast that followed him out of the woods, and he was afraid that he would lose his sanity long before Kenny arrived to clear the tree out of his pathway. After what seemed like a lifetime, Jacob heard the sound of Kenny's old truck sputtering up the road, and in just moments he was able to see the old red Chevrolet as it made its way closer to him. Jacob's spirits lifted when he saw his old friend and a sense of relief wash over him, as he realized he was no longer alone. Stepping out of his truck, Jacob said, Man, what took you so long? I asked you to hurry. Kenny, with an indignant look on his face, said, What are you talking about? You only called me 11 minutes ago. I think I made pretty good time. Jacob could hardly believe that only 11 minutes had passed. It seemed so much longer. After apologizing to his friend and telling him exactly how happy he was to see him, both men walked over to the fallen tree and made a discovery that startled them both. The tree had not broken. It had not been cut. It had been pushed over and completely uprooted. All around the tree were large, bipedal footprints that had a somewhat human appearance to them, but if they were human, the owner would require a size 28 shoe. Jacob and Kenny looked at each other, and then without a word went to work on the tree. Kenny took a chainsaw from the bed of his truck and began to cut the fallen blockade. Meanwhile, Jacob pulled the logs and debris from the road. Mission accomplished. Kenny put away his saw, and he and Jacob were about to get in their vehicles and leave. But before either man had even opened their doors, an ear-splitting scream that would have filled a banshee with paralyzing fear erupted from the woods behind them. Warily, Jacob walked over to Kenny and whispered, That's what I was telling you about. I don't know what that thing is, man, but it looks like some kind of monster. I think we need to get out of here. Now. Kenny, who looked as though the blood had drained completely out of his face, became very pale as he said to Jacob. Jacob, man, I've never mentioned this to anyone before now, but over the last few months, that thing has been killing off a few of my cows. Their throats are usually torn out, and the bodies are mangled and broken. I didn't want anyone to accuse me of being crazy and making stuff up, so I never said anything about it. But that's the reason I rushed over when you called. I've heard the sounds a few times off in the distance, at night, but never this close, so... I think you're right, old buddy. It is time to go. 
Cautiously and with a sense of urgency, Jacob and Kenny climbed into their vehicles and expeditiously made their way back to the blacktop. Turning left, both vehicles began the two and a half mile trek that led back to Jacob's house so they could decide what course of action they should take. Jacob could feel the temperature drop as snow began to fall gently. He reached over and turned his wipers on as the snow began to pelt the windshield harder. As he passed his neighbor, William Springer's farm, he noticed a herd of deer grazing in the field that bordered his property. Having put a bit of distance between himself and the nightmare he had just encountered, Jacob felt a renewed sense of security as his fatigued nerves began to calm. Not willing to let this opportunity pass by, Jacob turned on his hazard lights and pulled to the shoulder off the road, and signaled Kenny to do the same. Kenny instinctively knew what Jacob was thinking as he pulled in behind him and turned his ignition off. Getting out of his truck, Kenny said, What are you doing, man? We need to get out of here now. Jacob said, I know, I know. And we will. Just a minute, man. I can't just turn this down. I have to take the shot. That is a six-point buck over there. It's not the trophy that I wanted, but at least I won't go home empty-handed. And after the morning, I think we've had. I think we deserved a little something good. All right, just take the shot so we can go. I still don't feel right about this, Kenny said. Steadying his rifle across the hood of his truck, Jacob zeroed in on the buck and prepared to fire. That's when he heard Kenny making a gasping noise and whispered, Oh my god. What is it, man? What's wrong with you? Raise your scope three inches, he said. Raising the scope three inches, Jacob immediately saw what had been the cause of Kenny's alarm. Standing just outside of the tree line, in the edge of the field was the creature that they had left behind. Not even five minutes. Was this thing following them? Was it after the deer? What was it doing? Jacob watched the creature through the scope for a full 30 seconds before it ever moved, and when it did, it ignored him and the deer and started to lope off towards William's barn that was just 500 yards away from where the woodland demon had just been standing. Jacob called out to Kenny and said, Kenny, call William and tell him that there's something trying to get into his barn. I know he has at least two mares with foals in there, and if that thing gets in, it will kill all of them. In an attempt to be rid of this monster, werewolf, sasquatch, wendigo, or whatever it was, Jacob fired a shot but missed. The creature turned to their direction and glared at them through red, hateful eyes, and then began to run towards them at full steam. Kenny, who was still on the phone with William, screamed at Jacob to get in his truck and go. Jacob did as he was told, and Kenny followed suit. Starting their trucks, Jacob and Kenny both raced to Jacob's house, as though they were driving on the NASCAR circuit. Arriving at home, Jacob, gun in hand, ran inside and get the phone book so he could call the game warp and the police and get some kind of animal control out here to get rid of this thing. Jacob had just stepped out of his front porch when they heard gunfire coming from over William's place. Dropping the phone book and running back inside, Jacob grabbed the 12-gauge pump shotgun and some shells and handed them to Kenny, who took a little time in loading it. Jacob and Kenny now locked and loaded, walked together to Kenny's truck preparing to mount up a rescue for neighbor William. Simultaneously, both of them stopped in their tracks as an uneasy but familiar feeling crept over them, and Jacob's Rottweiler and two German shepherds began to whipper and ran under the front porch to hide. Kenny, whose throat had suddenly gone dry as a bone, whispered to Jacob and said, I have a really bad feeling about this. No sooner had the words escaped his lips, they heard a deafening scream erupt from the forest off to the right, and the creature exploded from the trees in front of them. Until now, neither man had been able to fully appreciate the colossal size and scope of the beast. But standing less than 30 feet away, they were almost overcome by the sheer magnitude of it. Jacob had seen it up close earlier from his truck while sitting down, and had guessed the height may be 8 feet. But now, standing there looking up, he could tell that this fellow was 8.5 or 9 feet tall, and would tip the scales around 1,000 pounds. It had inhumanely long arms that bulged with thick, ropey muscle, that were easily seen beneath its long, shaggy black hair, which covered it from head to toe. The chest was larger than a 55-gallon drum, and there is little doubt that it could pull the arms off an ape. And now it glared at them with malevolent intent. Jacob and Kenny both opened fire without hesitation. The creature screamed with rage as the bullets tore its massive body, knocking it to the ground, but not killing it or seriously injuring it. Jacob and Kenny watched speechless as it crawled into the tree line, struggling to its feet and limped away. 
Jacob ran back to the porch and grabbed the phone book and called the local game warden. Nearly two hours later, Gene Trauber, the local warden, showed up to take their statements and told them that he had been called out to answer numerous such reports in the area, but he wasn't sure what to make of all of their reports. Guys, he said, I don't know what to tell you. There is no such animal in this area, or in any area for that matter that fits your description. I'm not saying I don't believe you. I just don't know what it is. Jacobs, whose face was reddened with anger, said, Come here. Here's the blood from where we shot it, and here are the footprints. A look of complete confusion washed over Gene's face, and he asked if they would care to go with them as he tried to track it. Jacob and Kenny agreed, but they said that they weren't going anywhere without their guns. Gene stated that he planned to take his gun as well. All three men loaded their guns and set out following the deeply impressed tracks and droplets of blood that had fallen on withered leaves. They followed the trail for about a mile until arriving at a creek that was located deep in Jacob's woods, where the tracks that they were following were joined by others just like them. Some were smaller, but at least one set was larger. Deciding that the safest course of action would be to return home, they all went back to Jacob's. None of them relished the idea of staying out in the woods longer, since there was now apparently more than one creature, and the cloudy overcast day made the forest seem even darker than it would normally be this time of day. Back at Jacob's, Gene informed them that there was nothing left that he could do but file it under an unknown animal sighting, which made both Kenny and Jacob anything but happy. Jacob and Kenny spent the next couple of days trying to warn their neighbors to use caution when they were out in the forest. Most of their friends just laughed at them and said that they probably seen a bear or something. No one believed them except William, who had seen it himself the same day they had. They had even taken a shot at it, but missed. Jacob, William, and Kenny knew what they had seen, and they knew that it was still out there, and they didn't care who believed them and who didn't. Over the next few weeks, more and more neighbors began to take the stories a little bit more seriously, as family pets began to disappear and others were found brutally mangled. Other farms in the area began to find their cows and other livestock torn open with their throats ripped out. Just a few weeks after shooting the creature in his yard, Jacob's own Rottweiler was found dead with his throat torn out, hanging across a limb in the tree in his front yard. It almost seemed like a revenge killing. A few days later, one of William's new foals died the same way. The foal's mother had to be put to sleep because she had gone into shock over whatever she would witness in the barn when her foal was killed. Some people in the area still don't believe. They think the whole story was made up, but Jacob and Kenny know that there's still something out there in the forest. They still occasionally find tracks or a slaughtered cow or a goat. They still hear the blood-curdling screams off in the woods at night. They know that there is still something out there, watching and waiting, biding its time. Something cold and cunning and cruel. Something not human, with a taste for blood and revenge. Rabbits in the Creek I'm writing this because my family won't talk about it anymore. I'm the only one who can't seem to forget. I was raised on the outskirts of Preston, a small town in southern Idaho with a population of around 5,000. My more immediate community was isolated, dead-end dirt road called Bear Creek. Less than 20 families lived on Bear Creek. I didn't mind being so isolated. I grew up in the comfort of wide fields and close neighbors that only rural people know. We were a Mormon community, very church-centered, very community-centered. All the young girls, myself included, were part of the young women's group. All the boys were members of the local Boy Scout troop, which doubled as a church group in our area. We had Fourth of July parties at the local ballpark and swam in the nearby reservoir. It was a good, quiet community. My house, a 92-year-old farmhouse built by my great-great-grandfather, was situated on a small hill surrounded by a wide grass field on one side and a snaking dirt road on the other. Across the road was the creek bottoms. Southern Idaho is categorized in a desert climate, so not much grows in the irrigated fields besides sagebrush and burrs. The creek bottoms were the exception. The creek fed the growth of the thick tangle of pussy willow bushes. In the late fall, we used to go down there in the bottoms and pick the white cottony pussy willow seeds to decorate the fences of our driveway. Being so isolated, it wasn't uncommon for animals to come down from the mountains. 
We had a female moose who brought down her calf and lived in our other orchard every winter. And the occasional lion wasn't unheard of either. The summer when I turned eight, I remembered because it was the same year as my baptism. A smaller mountain lion was spotted several times in our area. We weren't worried. The big cats stayed away from the farms and usually moved on when the area didn't yield enough food. The same summer my neighbor Peyton was working on his Eagle Scout project. He loved National Geographic and thought it would be pretty cool to try putting together a National Geographic's mission on our little creek bottoms. The young lion that happened to be in our area at the same time made him especially excited. He decided he wanted to try and get pictures of the lion and emailed the National Geographic team for advice. They recommended setting up an automatic camera that takes shots every couple of seconds in the area that the lion was known to visit. They also recommended setting up some kind of bait so the lion was more likely to come by. No one in the creek liked the idea of live bait or carrion, so we came up with a different kind of bait. We decided to set up an audio recording of a dying rabbit and play it on loop through a set of speakers hidden in the willows. I remembered when everyone was down in the bottoms testing the speakers, and I heard the noise for the first time. The sound of the dying rabbit is horrible. It's described as being almost identical to the sound of a screaming child. If you've never heard it yourself, there's plenty of recordings available online. It's worth a listen. The camera was set up. The speakers were set up. Everything was perfect. Peyton explained that he would allow the camera and the recording to play uninterrupted for a week, and then he would go check on it. This would give time for our scent to fade from the bottoms and encourage the line to come closer. At first, I was worried about the noise. It was a truly horrible noise, and our house was the closest to the sit-up point in the bottoms. My father assured me that the noise wouldn't reach as far as our house, and I was relieved when we arrived at home that night, and he was correct. The bottoms were far enough away that I couldn't hear anything. I remember Peyton the next day in church. He was fidgety and excited to check on the equipment, but he had to wait a week, which everyone kept reminding him. He couldn't risk going down there too early and scaring the line away for good. That night, I woke up to an awful noise. I sat ramrod straight up in bed with my eyes wide in the dark. Hands clutched so hard my palms bore the indents of my fingernails for hours after. I knew that noise. It was the recording of the rabbit. It sounded faint and far off, like it really could have been coming from the bottoms, but that was impossible. Because the recording had been going all night the previous day, and I hadn't heard a thing. I didn't sleep that night. I was too scared to get out of my bed and wake my parents. The recording played over and over again. I had the loop memorized. In the morning, I stumbled into the kitchen for breakfast. My mom and dad were sitting at the kitchen table. They, too, had dark rings under their eyes. I hadn't been the only one who'd heard it. Mom was convinced that the equipment must have been broken. She wanted to go down into the bottoms to check it out. Dad refused. He was a kind gentleman and didn't want to stir up any unnecessary drama. He was sure that there'd been a strong wind last night, and the wind carried the noise farther than its natural reach. He told us to listen. We did. He was right. We couldn't hear it now. We forgot about it and went about our daily goings. The next night, it happened again. I stayed up in bed with my back to the wall. The screaming was even louder than before, but this time something was different. It was lower pitched than I remembered, and parts of the loop were slowed down, as if the recording were warped in places. At times, the loop did not loop naturally, and instead picked up at random places in the middle. My mom didn't mention anything at the breakfast table, but both her and my dad seemed tense. The third night, I mustered the courage to stand beside my bedroom window and look out into the yard. For a moment, I stood, rooted to the spot, my hands shaking no matter how hard I clenched them. The noise slid in through the cracks in the window. I watched the outline of the trees in the yard, perfectly still. Not even the slightest breeze stirred the branches. My mom announced that she'd be going to visit her sister in the town the next day, and would probably spend the night there. She invited me to come along, but I was Daddy's little girl at heart, and I chose to stay at the farm. I took Mom's place beside Dad in their bed that night, but even that didn't help. I don't think my dad was asleep either, for he was unnaturally still the whole night. We began to hear the noise during the day, too. I was drawing with chalk on the sidewalk when it happened. My shoulders tense and the hair on the back of my neck prickled. There was only one scream, a short, high-pitched one, and then the recording fell silent. It happened again several times, though, throughout the day. 
but never the whole loop, just clips from it. Later that evening, Peyton's dad came up the driveway on his four-wheeler. He said he was looking for their dog, a sweet yellow lab who had been missing since that morning. Dad said he was sorry and that he hadn't seen her. I stared at him, silently begging him to mention the recording, but he didn't. He was a quiet man after all. He didn't want to bring up any unnecessary drama. Mom stayed away the whole week. Dad and I didn't sleep. By Saturday, the screaming could be heard constantly, though it seemed to have deviated from this familiar loop entirely. I didn't recognize any of it. Sometimes the screams were thin and long, other times they were hardly more than growls. Once, while my dad had been heating up meatloaf for lunch, the noise rose in such a rancorous din that he dropped the plate and it shattered. I pressed my hand over my ears when I sat at the table, and I squeezed my eyes shut. But it didn't help. The noise forced its way through the cracks in my fingers, pinched my throat, and rattled in my ribcage. The din lasted for a whole minute, then fell silent. Dad was shaking. That was the last we heard of the noise that day. Peyton came by Saturday evening to ask permission to cross our road to collect the equipment. He was so excited. I watched him disappear into the creek bottoms with a sense of tired relief. After the equipment was gone, it would all stop. I couldn't wait to get a full night's sleep. Not a minute later, I spotted Peyton coming back up the creek. I was confused. It had taken us so much longer to set up the cameras and the speakers, so I'd only assumed it would take as long to collect them. My breath stilled when Peyton came closer. He didn't look right. His eyes were wide and his face pale. Something wet dribbled from his chin and onto his shirt. I later realized it was vomit. My dad caught him before he fell and demanded to know what had happened. Peyton couldn't speak. He just cried. We called his dad and I looked after Peyton as both my dad and his dad went into the bottoms. They were gone for a long time. When they returned, their faces were grim, and they smelled funny. I noticed red on my dad's hands. I asked what was wrong, but they brushed right past me and immediately called the police. Nobody would tell me what had happened. I sat on the couch as a blur of neighbors and police officers swirled around me. At one point, an officer placed something on the kitchen table and left. I looked into the kitchen curiously. It was the camera from the bottoms. I wish I hadn't looked. The camera was a little banged up. Tiny scratches and dents covered the plastic casing. When I lifted it, my hand stuck to the plastic. Something tacky and odorous covered the screen, but it turned on fine. The first set of photos were normal, just the pussy willow cast green and the glow of the night setting. As I continued to click through them, they quickly became strange. At one point, the camera angle changed, as if the camera had been knocked from its post. Grass now obscured most of the frame. Flecks of red appeared on the lens and remained for the rest of the sets. One photo made me pause. There was a figure in this one, or half a figure, as most of the upper torso hadn't made it into the frame. I thought it could be human, but it didn't look like it should be standing upright. Its legs were twisted like an animal, and it seemed to be having difficulty supporting itself in an upright position. Beside the legs, a long, thin arm hung. Whatever it was, it must have been stooping over, for its fingertips hung below its correct knees. The next set was different. It was as if the camera had been picked up and was now being held. The first photo was of the bottoms at night. The next startled me. I had looked too closely before deciding when it was. A rabbit had been laid in the bushes, but its ears and most of its scalp had been peeled away. The next was of the same rabbit, but a thin dark hand was holding it up against the sky. Its limp body hung like something from a nightmare. In the following photos, more rabbits joined the one, each with their ears and scalps removed. Then a cat. Then more cats. Then a dog. The yellow lab. Then the lion. The following photo was of seven rabbits, three cats, one dog, and the lion all laid out in a row facing the same way. Their arms and legs had been arranged as if they were marching like some parade. All of their scalps had been removed, and tiny white glints of their skulls could be seen. The last photo was overly bright, like the photo had been taken too close with the flash on. An eye dominated the frame, but it was yellowed and crusted, and had a bar pupil like a horse. In the bottom corner of the edge, a mouth could be seen. No lips, just teeth, sharp and little, with little white gaps of red gums between them. I wish I hadn't looked. I heard my dad talking to the police outside. They said the speakers had malfunctioned. The recording had only played the first night.
I was hired about 12 years ago to trap and hunt these wild hogs that has been plaguing this farmer's land for quite some time. If you know anything about hogs, is that they can get quite big, and they're very aggressive. What I would typically do, and what I've done in the past, is I'd set up random traps around the property. These traps would basically be a circular fence about 30 feet in diameter. The fence would have a gate that would close shut after a certain amount of hogs would be in the trap. I set up three traps like this on the property in order to maximize what I could catch. I set up my traps and I waited through the night to see what I would catch. The next morning I took my horse out and checked the traps. The first two were empty. The last trap had about seven hogs in it, all of which were pretty good size. I didn't do anything with the last trap and I left the hogs alone. In order for me to reset the trap, I'd have to kill all of the hogs, haul them out of there, and reset it. I would not be able to haul all of the hogs out with just my horse. I'd need my truck for that. I rode my horse back, dropped it off, and picked up my truck, and went out for the third trap. Upon arriving to the third trap, the hogs were in a frenzy. Something must have stirred them up while I was gone. I noticed that some of the hogs were injured and had blood on them. This wasn't necessarily surprising. Hogs would not only injure, but also kill and eat other hogs, if given the chance. But upon counting the hogs, I noticed that two of them had gone missing. Instead of seven hogs, there were only five. My only conclusion was that I either miscounted, or two of them had escaped. At this point, it didn't even cross my mind that something had taken them. The only animal that I could think of that could do that was maybe a bear which we weren't in bear country, so I figured that I just miscounted. I killed the five hogs, reloaded the trap, and loaded the hogs back into my truck. I had a special ramp on the back of my truck bed that I'd use to pull the hogs into. Some of these hogs weigh 200 pounds, and there's no way I could do this by myself unless I had a ramp. I drove back and checked the other two traps before calling it a day. To be honest, I was kind of confused about the two missing hogs. Did I really miscount? I can understand if it was 20 or 30 hogs, but 7? Seven? 7 isn't that high of a number. At this point, my common sense told me that these two hogs just slipped away, and that was that. The next day came and I checked the traps again on horseback. The first two traps had hogs in them, which was really good news. The first one only had 4, while the second one had 12. What this meant was that the hogs were being drawn out from the woods, coming closer and closer to my traps, and falling for it. This made my job a lot easier. I went and checked my third and final trap, the trap that was the deepest in the woods, and to my surprise, there weren't any hogs inside of it. I was quite surprised that there weren't any hogs in this trap. If there were to be a trap that had hogs in it, it'd be this one. After quickly inspecting the trap, I noticed that the trap had shut, meaning something had triggered it, but there weren't any hogs inside. When I went to reset the trap, I noticed bits and pieces of hogs all over the inside of the trap. Normally when hogs eat one another, there is a remaining hog standing, a last survivor. What had eaten these hogs, and more importantly, how did it get out of the trap? The trap's fence was about seven feet tall, even tall for me. Granted, the fence was chain-linked, meaning that I could climb out of it, but I don't know of any animal that could do that. Some animal jumping seven feet that lives in America doesn't sound realistic. Again, I was confused about this third trap, but then again I just reset the trap and went about my day. The third day came and I checked the traps again. The first two traps in total had 20 hogs. I was quite anxious to see what the third trap would have. For a second day in the row, the trap had been closed, but there were no hogs inside. Again, there were bits and pieces of hogs that remained, but no live ones. Something must have been eating them. I checked the inside of the traps for tracks of any kind, but the hogs' footprints had damaged the soil too much that I couldn't see anything. It finally clicked in my mind that it was probably a cougar, a large one. I asked the farmer for permission to hunt the cougar at night, which he agreed. He didn't want the cougar eating any of his livestock. I reset all three traps, and I waited for nightfall. Cougars are nocturnal animals, for the most part, and like to hunt at night. 
I decided that riding my horse out would be the best option. My truck would be too distracting and would scare off the cougar. I waited till 1am to go hunting. This would give my traps enough time to catch some hogs, which would be perfect bait for this cougar. 1am came around and I took off on horseback. All I brought with me was my rifle and a heavy duty flashlight. This was before the time of smartphones, and I obviously didn't own any night vision goggles. Looking back, this was really dumb. At the very least, I should have at least brought someone with me, but I didn't. I rode past the first two traps and on my way to the third one, when I started to hear the sounds of wild hawks squealing. I knew that I was right on time to catch the cougar in the act. I quickly rode out to the third trap, flashlight in hand. When I first arrived at the trap, I didn't know what I was looking at. All I saw were wild hogs running around crazily inside the trap. However, I did notice something very large inside that didn't look like a hog. Instead of pulling out my rifle, I just sat there looking at what kind of creature was inside this trap. My flashlight must have caught the creature's attention, and it stopped what it was doing and stood up. The best way I could describe it was that it was like a dog, but also human at the same time. Its features resembled that of a werewolf or a very large dog standing on two legs, and I was completely terrified. My horse, being confused and frightened, took off back the way we came. I could see now that the creature was ignoring the hogs, and its attention was on us. I heard the sound of something jumping over a fence and giving chase behind us. I urged my horse to run faster, but it was too slow for this thing. The creature made a couple swipes at my horse, which my horse reacted in pain. My horse had significantly slowed, and the creature was able to gain. The creature tackled the horse from behind, causing me to be bucked off. My horse and my rifle were now in the clutches of this large beast. The beast was now eating my horse, and I had no choice but to run. Thankfully, I wasn't too far away, and I was able to make it back safely. The creature seemed to be pretty satisfied with my horse, and thankfully it didn't chase me. If it did, I would not be able to be here today telling you my story. In 2006, I was living in a small town in Utah where I used to manage rental properties up in the mountains. The events I'm about to speak of are not covered by the news. The people that do speak about these events are often labeled conspiracy theorists and not taken seriously. At the time, my business was growing quite exponentially. The more my business grew, the more rental properties I was able to make deeper and farther up the mountain. The people love the properties. Something about being secluded up in the mountains was very attractive to people. Everything was going fine until one day I got a call from one of my workers. He said that he was clearing land on a new property that we just purchased and saw something strange. At first, he said that he thought it was a mound of dirt, but upon further review, he saw that it was something more sinister. The mound of dirt turned out to be a mound of flesh. The mound was comprised of skin and bone of animals. There is no animal that I know of that would do this. This must have been a person, a very sick and demented person. Why would he leave a mound of skin and bone out in the middle of the woods? I told my worker to remove the mound and get back to work, which he hesitantly did. I showed up at the site about 30 minutes later. The site was pretty deep into the woods up into the mountain, deeper than I've ever been. During the build at this location, I'd have workers tell me that they've seen something in the woods, stalking them. This could have very well been a cougar, which are quite popular in this area. I told my workers to be alert at all times, and for all project managers, to carry a firearm. This property was trouble from the start. For whatever reason, I had builders and construction workers quit on me, saying that they didn't feel safe this far into the mountains. This was silly to me. I used them in all my other properties before, and they didn't have any issues. They kept saying something to me about a presence in the mountains, something watching them. I was finally able to hire a contractor that was able to finish the property. He did a pretty decent job, although he was kind of expensive. I was able to find tenants for the property, and I continued building other locations. Three properties later, I get the same call from a different worker, 
saying that they saw a mound of flesh in the woods. I remember what had happened last time, and I told them not to touch it, and that I'd be right there. A part of me didn't believe what I was hearing. There's no way there's a mound of flesh just sitting out in the woods. I figured he was exaggerating. But sure enough, when I showed up, there certainly was a mound of flesh. The smell was terrible, but the bugs were probably worse. Sure enough, there was about a four-foot mound of flesh that someone placed out in the woods. I debated with one of my workers that maybe this was a gut pile of a larger animal, but that still wouldn't explain the organization of the flesh into a pile. Predators up in the mountains typically eat most of the animal. This mound seemed to be comprised of four different animals, all compiled into one. The skin that had been removed looked almost surgical, as if someone did it with a razor's edge. Instead of removing the mound, I told my worker to contact the police. Nothing came of it, but I just figured it'd be a good idea to get something on record. This new property was different from the last one. Something about the atmosphere was more intense. It was as if I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be, as if there was a part of the forest that was forbidden. At this point in the story, I started getting calls from tenants, mainly the newer ones, saying how their pets have gone missing. They wanted to know if there were any predators in the area, and I told them no. That was an obvious lie. I then started getting reports about people peering into windows. Like I said before, the area is pretty secluded, the reports were that there was a pale man peering into windows, but only at night. Things started to get more serious when actual tenants went missing. We only found that they went missing since that they were not able to check out at one of the properties. These were the same people that claimed that there was someone peering into the house. I contacted the police and told them what had happened. They went up to the property and collected what evidence they could. There was not much that they could do. The police told me that they figured that they just went hiking up in the mountains and got lost. To be fair, that is a probable explanation. I continued to run out properties. I acted as if nothing had happened. I suppose that is wrong of me. But there was no way for me to know what was going to happen. About two months later, I started getting reports about a pale man walking around on all fours out in the woods. He would be seen just outside of homes peering in and out of houses. At the same time, tenants would go missing. This was the point I was starting to put the two connections together. It was as if the houses that he's peering into, those people would go missing. I contacted the police again, except this time, rather than the police, a government agency came out and investigated. They came out in unmarked vehicles and with heavy weaponry. They came and stayed at one of my properties in hopes to find some of the missing tenants. They asked me permission to reinforce the entryways to the buildings. I agreed, as long as they kept me updated on what was going on. Two weeks in, and I get a disturbing phone call late at night. I am told that I have to remove all of my tenants on the mountain, out of the houses. I ask for a further explanation, and ask to meet up in the morning. I go to one of the homes at which the investigation is taking place. The agents are waiting for me outside. Outside the house, there are these huge crates that are labeled hazardous. There was about four of them, and I was not able to get a great look at them. The agents then told me something very disturbing about the mountain. They were able to disclose that they found the missing tenants. They were found in a meat pile not too far away. They then told me something that I'm not sure that I believe. They told me that these attacks were caused by rabid bears that lived in the mountain. All of my time working here on the mountain, I'd never seen a bear once, so I'm not sure what I believe. They also told me that I was not able to rent out any properties on the mountain anymore. This was quite devastating. I pressed them for answers as to why I was not able to work anymore and what actually happened on the mountain. They told me that the information was classified. Before the agents left, one of the agents said something to me that keeps me up at night. He said, whatever these things are, there's more than one of them. The Chanting in the Woods I don't sleep with my window open anymore. No matter how hot outside it gets, that window stays closed. It's been this way for a long time, since I was very young. 
it's not a real hit with the ladies during the summertime. People usually recommend air conditioners, and I usually go with the Prospect when I have the company. But when it's in, I don't usually sleep well at all because I can only imagine how easy it would be for anyone to bypass them. There is a single perk to the AC though, well, besides the relief from the hot stickiness of the summer's humidity, and that's the steady hum which stifles the silence. I don't like the silence, you see. There was a time when it brought me an almost zen-like level of peace and tranquility, but now I find it invasive, dangerous. Silence never comes alone. From time to time, I can still hear the chanting from my youth. I can hear them all, wordlessly and yet with prestigious synchronicity and harmony with one another. Their conjoined voices echo from the woods like the gentle and yet threatening breeze that precedes a violent hailstorm, rhythmic yet senseless. It never went away, and yet I know they've all moved on or died. I know this all very well. When I was about nine years old, my dad and I lived in this old rented two-family apartment house in the town called Bridgewater in the state of Massachusetts. We lived on the bottom floor. The second floor wasn't used. It was recently vacated by its prior residence. It was a very quiet neighborhood, very suburban with plenty of woods. Behind our house, there was a backyard that proceeded into a large forest that spanned it out for miles. I used to play in them. My dad and mother were recently divorced, so there were just the three of us living here. Me, him, and the dog, Cash, who was named after the late country singer, Johnny Cash. He was an old Scottish terrier, you know the type, ankle biters with these really ugly bearded faces. They got him as a pup when I was still on diapers, and he was a lifelong friend. He may have been something of an idiot, but at the time, he was all I had. I cried and cried when my mom tried to take him. In the end, he was left in my father's care, for my sake. Cash and I would spend a lot of time playing in the woods. When you're young, your imagination is a very powerful thing, and the woods had an almost magic quality in the terms of supplementation for my imagination. I would play army, build forts, climb trees. One time, me and Cash traveled so far in the woods, I actually got lost. We were losing daylight as it was October, and the light was fading at a much faster rate. I began to panic, afraid I'd be trapped out here in the pitch black. As we walked around, frantic for landmarks, anything familiar, that's when I saw it. The clearing, with a large rock in the center. It wasn't exactly uncommon to see graffiti and vandalism in the woods. A public forest is quite well known for trees with messages carved into them. Names, swastikas, Brad, and Jan forever, and a nice cute heart. Stuff like that. Not to mention the pseudo-gang names spray-painted on rocks. That was my impression I got of this place. A hangout for older kids. But something wasn't right. Me being only nine, my mind wasn't exactly capable of comprehending the connotations of symbols and other things. And yet there was something really off about these images. I've never seen anything like them before. The surrounding trees had crudely shaped images of what appeared to be a goat-man hybrid, like a stick figure with an unnecessarily detailed goat head imposed over where you would expect to see a very basic stick figure face. These images were drawn over and over and over again, all over the trees that surrounded the clearing, almost obsessively so, and not just the basic human height level, but all of the trees as if whoever carved them had to use a ladder. The rock itself had red markings all over it, letters that I've never seen before. Underneath, though, was written in black spray paint, a message I could actually read. It said, Behold the wisdom of the horned, and below that were five painted lines. They were all the same height except for the two outer lines that were twice the height and spiraled outwards at the top. What really scared me about this place, though, were the dolls. They were hanging from the branches around the clearing. They appeared to have been woven out of sticks, and poorly so. Taking a closer look, I realized what was so scary about them. While the sticks of the dolls were clearly constructed of the grace of crappy arts and crafts students, the heads of them were drying clean skulls of animals. I don't know what of, but they were bleached white, 
dry and clean. They're hollow sockets. I can't explain it effectively without sounding insane, but there is something sentient about them, watchful and pleading. I could feel their eyes on me, though they had none to watch with. I felt fear. Not my own fear, mind you, but something, an aura of emotion that made absolutely no sense. Have you ever been at an underage drinking party that got crashed by the police? It's that kind of fear. The fear that comes synonymously with trouble. I can't explain why I did it, but I reached up and touched one. Maybe it was a child's general inquisitive nature that compelled me. Maybe it was fascination, or an intense desire to quell my fear and convince myself that they were just dolls and not watchful spirits I would eventually come to believe they were. When I touched it, the skull fell off. The doll unwound itself, only a piece of it remained attached to the rawhide rib that it was suspended from. The skull cracked when it hit the ground. When it happened, there was a certain quality that quelled inside me. As naive as my nine-year-old could be, there was also a certainty that remained with me to this day. I don't belong here. Cash immediately started barking when the doll fell. It startled me so effectively that I let out a scream. I looked up. The sky was glowing red with darkness not too far behind. The sun was going down and I had to get out of here. Cash was staring at me, black eyes wide open and tail wagging violently. He was barking at me, insistently. He began to growl at something. Maybe air, maybe ghosts. When I approached him, he turned and ran. Cash was my only companion in this unnatural place and I would be darned if I was going to let him betray me into solitude here, so I gave chase. I ran for my life. The last thing I saw before I chased Cash was something that really messed with me. All the other dolls that were hanging when I first arrived were dangling. Some were even spinning lazily in the breeze, and yet as I ran after Cash, I saw every single doll on sight was completely stationary, staring and facing me directly. I was dismissive of this detail as I was more afraid of being alone. I never let Cash out of my sight. He led me straight home. I never loved my dog more than when I realized what he had done for me. Dogs are never lost. They always know their way. Before I went to bed, I told my dad what I saw. He laughed it off and told me that it was just teenagers being punks and that I should let it go. I found it comforting and was almost willing to let it go. I even fell asleep without any trouble. That night was when I heard it for the first time, the noise that haunt me to this very day. I woke up and could hear noises coming through my window. I got up and looked out to listen closer. That's when I realized it was chanting. Voices. Dozens, maybe. They were coming from in the woods. I could hear them loudly and rhythmically. I don't know what they were saying, but I could tell it was ceremonious. Like a hymn you'd hear people sing in churches, except it felt dark, a violent even. I immediately thought about the clearing with the rock, the dolls, the fear. I knew in my bones that the chanting was coming from there. What scared me the most was that it wasn't far. It wasn't far at all. The chanting went on for hours. I just lied there in my bed, wide-eyed with fear listening to it, praying that it stop. It wouldn't, though. It went on until four in the morning when the early birds began to wake. I stopped playing in the woods. My dad noticed the behavior immediately and asked if I was all right. I told him about the chanting, and again he shrugged his shoulders and said it was probably some teenagers drinking beers and having a party. I asked him why they drink beer and chant the same sound for five hours. He told me that they weren't chanting, that I was just imagining it, and that I should close the window from now on. I probably should have listened to him, but I didn't. Curiosity got the better of me. The next night, the chanting began again at exactly 11 o'clock. It seemed louder than before. I couldn't sleep hearing it, but I couldn't bring myself to close the window. I don't know why I thought this way, probably because I was just a child. I dim-wittedly thought at the time that if I closed my window, I wouldn't be able to hear them coming if they decided to break into the house. The logic is flawed, I know that they would still be chanting as they emerged from the woods and crossed my yard, and not be nice and quiet about it. But that's how I thought back then. That's why I couldn't close the window, because I had to know 
if they were coming. This went on for several days, every night from 11 to 4, exactly on the dot. Sometimes I could see in the woods, way, way, way out there, a faint glow, like the light of a fire. But it was so faint and far in between that I didn't know whether to acknowledge it or dismiss it as a trick of my own eyes. Other times I would successfully fall asleep due to exhaustion, only to wake up several hours later in panic, still able to hear it. I asked my dad if Cash could sleep with me in my room on the third night, and he said it'd be fine. It felt better knowing that I had the dog to keep me company while I would hear the noise. And better yet, if I could hear them coming, he would too, then be a dog about it and start barking out the window at them. I anticipated a good night's sleep and felt even silly for not thinking about this solution earlier. I fell asleep at eight with Cash sleeping at the foot of my bed. I woke up a quarter past eleven to Cash barking. He was on his two hind legs, tail wagging spastically, and he was barking out the window, ears pointing up, barking, growling, howling out the window. I immediately got out of bed and looked out the window towards the woods. Nothing. Nothing at all. Cash was very agitated, growling and looking at me, then back out the window and barking. The chanting was still going on, same as the last couple of days. I remember feeling uncomfortable that Cash was barking at the noise, that if he was in danger of getting their attention. I tried to calm him down. That's when my dad came in. He stumbled in groggily and picked up the dog and turned to walk out the door with him, mumbling about shutting up. I called his name, but he was so asleep that he practically was dead on his feet. I screamed at him, Dad, the woods! That got his attention. He turned around and walked up to me, looked out the window, and then back at me. This again? He mumbled. Look, boy, it's just your imagination. No, listen! That's what Cash was going crazy about! There are people singing in the woods. Just listen. He looked carefully out the window. Cash was growling in his arms as he turned his head out the window. I listened too, but there was nothing. No sound. Total silence. I couldn't believe it. Could this have been a coincidence? My dad told me to go to sleep and left my room, mumbling insults at Cash. The silence chilled me far more than the chanting ever did. At least when they were singing their malicious hymns. There was at least a sense of distance between them and me. But right now, I know they're out there. But I don't know where. I had no bearing whatsoever. What was even worse, what wrought unprecedented terror upon me, was that there was no nighttime ambience in those woods. No crickets. Evenings brought those things out in droves this time of year. And even when they were chanting, I could still hear them. But now, it was quieter than a bone-chilling winter night pure silence. How long did I stare out that window, at those woods across my backyard? I have no idea. But when I woke up the next day, I was still sitting in the chair I planted right by it. That morning over breakfast, I insisted that there really was chanting out there, but my dad wasn't hearing any of it. He put his foot down and told me that he won't be hearing any more of this, that I needed to grow up and take responsibility and stop being so afraid all the time. You know, Typical tough guy dad stuff. I didn't even bother to bring up the lack of crickets, knowing full well that he'd have made up an explanation for that as well, so I kept quiet and ate my breakfast. Later that day, I was waiting for my mom to pick me up at the end of my dad's driveway to bring me to my grandma's house where she was currently living. It was Friday and my mom had me on the weekends. As I was waiting, a large black pickup truck passed by the house, very slowly. It came to a stop right in front of me, there were two men in the truck, older, about my dad's age. At first, I thought maybe they were friends of his, but this thought didn't last. The driver rolled down his window and looked at me. He was bald and was wearing abnormally slim sunglasses. He was smoking a thin cigar, or a cigarillo. I remember the strong smell of it. He looked at me as if he was sizing me up, investigating for a moment until finally he smiled at me, reached over and hit his friend on the shoulder, and pointed me out to him. He, too, was bald and was wearing the same sunglasses. They said something to each other, and then the driver looked back at me with a terrible smile and drove away, waving slowly at me as he did so. They passed me by three more times before my mom finally picked me up. 
I didn't give those two any thought, and just took comfort in the thought that I'd be sleeping somewhere else for the next couple of nights. The weekend went by without a hitch, and sleeping over Grandma's house was such a relief. When I told her and my mom about the voices in the woods, they just looked at each other and told me to tell my dad about it. Frustrated, I argued that I did, but it was pointless. She too used the, it's just your imagination crap, same as my dad. Not once during the whole experience did the memory leave my mind, of the two men in the trunk or the distant chanting. Soon enough, I'd have to return. Sunday night came along and I was dropped back off at my dad's house, where I would spend the whole day dreading the inevitable nightfall, dreading the answer of whether or not I could hear the chanting in the woods, hear the strange people sing their dark songs in unison. I begged my dad to let me keep cash in my room with me tonight, but he said no leaving me to face whatever happened next, alone. So come bedtime, I was sitting in my chair by the window, staring out into the darkness until the hour came. I stayed up until 11, expecting to hear it, but what I got was silence. No singing, no crickets either, just pure silence. I couldn't tell if I was relieved or terrified. Maybe they all moved on. Maybe they went somewhere else to play their creepy games. It took some self-convincing, but... I managed to call myself to such a state of mind where I could actually go to sleep, knowing that I was safe. Reluctantly, I crawled into my bed and closed my eyes. I woke up to the most chilling thing I'd ever seen. It was surreal, the image of it, every time I sleep. My brain immediately surged itself into full function, beyond consciousness and straight into full-fledged fight-or-flight mode as a cold, rough hand forced its way over my mouth and shoved my face into my own mattress. I felt a body much larger than mine bear down on me. I felt the jagged kneecap ram itself directly into my stomach, as I was then pulled out of my bed and wrestled into a standing position, the cold hand still holding my mouth shut. Another hand wedged my left hand directly behind my back, pulling me upwards until the pain became so unbearable, I thought my arm was going to come off. Shh. A voice whispered in my ear. His breath was ice cold. Yes, said another voice across the room. My eyes were well adjusted to the darkness, as it was, and I could see, through the moonlight shining into my now-opened window, a man wearing a horrible, horrible mask. At first, I thought he had the head of a goat, but I knew better. The goat stared with lifeless marbles where its eyes should have been. Its head was a mask made out of a severed head of a goat, or a ram, not properly stuffed and half-rotten. Its horns curled into a spiral jetting out of its head, and random patches of fur were missing, simply to show raw, blistering skin. I tried to scream, but the hand over my mouth tightened its grip. My arm behind my back pulled near breaking point. Scream, and we'll kill you, the voice whispered in my ears. My eyes couldn't. No, they wouldn't break away from that horrible person wearing the severed goat head as a mask. He was shirtless, wearing a necklace of what appeared to be bones. He was horribly emaciated, and there were markings all up and down his torso. In his right hand, he held a knife about the size of my forearm. Its build wasn't like any knife I'd ever seen. It took a step closer to me and pressed it up against my throat. The steel was bitterly cold, and the tip of the blade was sharper than anything I'd ever felt. It would take less than four ounces of pressure to open my throat, and they knew that I knew it. I couldn't cry. I couldn't even breathe. In its other hand, it held a basic candle. Tomorrow, the thing said, his voice muffled by the lifeless dead goat mask. You will exit your house at midnight. You will light this candle. Place it on the ground in the center of your yard, and you will sit behind it, legs crossed, right foot on top of your left knee, and vice versa. If you don't do this, the voice whispered into my ear, the blood of your loved ones will be on your hands. The goat man quickly retreated the blade from my neck. I don't remember what happened next. I remember waking up in my bed, panting and crying. My dad came in to see what was wrong with me, and when I told him, he told me it was just a nightmare. At this point, he sat down at the end of my bed. He looked very wary, like he didn't want to say what he was about to say. He rubbed his eyes with his fist and wearily explained to me that this was all just me stressing out over the divorce that maybe we should look into talking to a therapist about these voices and hallucinations I've been having. I remember feeling so betrayed, so alone by the unfairness of that. 
I argued with him that everything I was seeing and hearing was true, but it was too late. He and Mom talked it out, my behaviors, my claims. They think I was losing my stuff over the divorce. Their minds were made up. Nothing I was going to say would convince them otherwise. And of course, in hindsight, it only made perfect sense. Who would believe a nine-year-old when they said that they were hearing voices? I was silent the whole day. Cash sat with me in my room as I wasted the daylight playing video games. I didn't speak to my old man, not once. I could see the weary look on his face when he'd walk by my room, but he didn't want to press the issue. He looked just as defeated as I did. He spent most of his time on the phone. It wasn't until later that day I found myself recalling what the goat thing said to me before everything went dark, that I had to light a candle at midnight. But when I woke up that morning, there was nothing in my room. There was a sudden sense of hope because when I searched around my room trying to find his candle, it was nowhere to be found. Never. Even to this day have I searched so hard for something only to be frantically pleased by the end results. It was gone. Have I been alleviated from the duties imposed to me by these strange interlopers? The relief was unbelievable. Like I was severed from this horrible burden. Even the thought of being forced to see a shrink didn't seem so harsh compared to the prospect that maybe these attackers were really just a bad dream. A severely realistic dream, mind you. But a dream nevertheless. Maybe. Maybe the whole situation really was over. Maybe these horrible people did move on, and that the goat man was simply a mental projection of my own imaginative expectation towards whatever it was those unnatural proceedings just beyond my sight were. You know, speculation. Nightfall came, and for the first time in a week, I felt no fear at the prospect of it. That felt good. Like things were going back to normal. But I was wrong. I was so wrong. When I placed my head on my pillow, Eyes already closing, consciousness already drifting away. I felt a lump under my pillow. Curiously, I reached down there and felt something. Something long and smooth. I pulled out a candle. A tall, thin wax candle with a nice, long wick. It was red, just like the one the goat man was holding. My heart sank. My mouth went dry. Tears ran down my cheeks. And in that moment, I relived the entirety of that last night all over down to the very last detail, where the guy holding me whispered in my ear on how the blood of the loved ones would be on my hands. Suddenly, I was back in hell. I was back in the realm of terror. How did they get the candle under my pillow? Had I overlooked it this whole time? I lie in bed until midnight. I didn't dare close my eyes for fear of being held at knife point again, for the fear of coming face to face with that horrible goat creature. The night was silent. No crickets. No birds. Nothing. Dead silence. I could see that it had turned 12.01. The memory of the goat mask in my mind, uttering its instructions to me over and over again. Go outside. Light the candle. Sit behind it. Do it or the blood of my loved ones will be on my hands. At the time, I didn't know what it meant to have the blood on your hands. The following day, I would learn exactly what it meant. Around ten minutes in, I mustered up the courage to walk over to my window. Look out it. What I saw choked me on the spot. Side by side at the entrance of the woods, I saw men. Shadowed by the night, standing side by side. There must have been twenty of them. None of them were saying anything. They were all dead silent, and I could feel their eyes on me. It was just as strong as when I felt the eyes of the dolls on my back at their side. In a way, they felt like the same presence, the same intelligence. I can't explain it. And then, I saw them. The goat man, or rather the silhouette of him, standing in the center of the figures. He was still, still as a stone, but I could make out the face shape, the jutting horns. I could make it all out. I chickened out. I couldn't go out there. I just couldn't. I hid in my bed, blankets over my head, and I shut my eyes tight, crying all night. I didn't fall asleep until I heard the early morning birds. I was awakened by 11.30. Shortly after breakfast, I heard my dad shouting in my front yard. I went out to check and see what was happening, what it was that had him so upset. As I went out the front door, I could hear him more clearly. I could hear pain in his voice. A knot formed in my throat, and a harrowing sensation crawled across my skin. I was not ready to learn about the events that transpired. And that was truly the scariest part. 
the moment before actualization. These people have mentioned blood on my hands. I didn't know what it meant, but I had a very vague idea that it meant my family getting hurt. I thought they got my dad. When I got to him, I saw that he was on his knees, crying. Cash was killed. He was hit by a car. There he laid. Goofy pointed ears, his absurd silly dog beard, black staring eyes, and a hanging tongue, stationary, forever. I saw that his center torso had been collapsed, and I could see his opening in his rear side, his ribs jetting out, his entrails. Son! My dad cried out as he turned to hug me. It's okay. He quickly led me back into the house, away from Cash's lifeless body, away from my best friend, dead and mutilated on the side of the road. The last thing I remember seeing as I was brought into the house was a large pickup truck, driving by slowly. I saw the same two bald men, as old as Dad, staring at me through oddly slim sunglasses. I saw blood on the front right tire, and I saw the driver point directly at me. Cash's death was my fault. As I said it out loud, my dad held me tight and said with a stone-cold certainty that it wasn't my fault, that sometimes things like this happen. He told me exactly what you would expect a father to tell his kid when their pet is killed in a random and seemingly pointless accident. But I knew better. The people in the woods killed Cash, and it was all because I didn't do what they said. It was because I was a coward. His blood was on my hands, just as they said it would be. When I went into my room to cry, I saw outside my window a man in the center of my backyard. A man with no shirt on. He was wearing a mask made out of the severed goat's head hollowed out on the inside. In the daylight, it was far more disturbing to see, because I could almost smell the lack of sanitation it had to have exerted. I could see that it was surrounded by flies, but even worse than that, I saw a note it was holding up, a piece of paper with a single word written across it. Midnight. I couldn't handle it. I ran outside to chase him down, but when I got outside, it was gone. My hate and my anger somehow superseded my guilt and sadness because I ran far into the woods before realizing that, this time, if I got lost, I wouldn't have cash to lead me back to the house. I would be all alone. No. I would have whatever was with me out here. I could feel eyes in here. I could feel eyes everywhere. My every movement was being watched, from the autumn canopy to the bushes just yards away. I knew I was surrounded in here. And as my senses came more clear from the adrenaline-fueled rage I was experiencing, I realized it was only getting stronger by the minute. Then I noticed the smell, the stench. At the time, I thought it smelled like bad milk or bologna left in the refrigerator for too long. It was strong, too strong. My eyes began to water, and I could feel my stomach begin to turn. How could a smell be so painful to endure? Then it occurred to me. They killed my best friend. There was only one more life they could take. My dad's. The presence became stronger. I could hear whispers in the wind. The smell grew more powerful with every breath. Any second, I was certain I would be overwhelmed by God knows what. I realized that if I didn't want to do what they demanded me, I would be taken here, and now, what could I have done? I shook my head and began to cry. Okay, I'll do it. The relief was instantaneous. The woods became brighter, the smell gone, the feeling of being watched replaced by what could only be described as serene. The forest went from a den of unspeakable terror to a place of, well, it was just the woods again, just as it always was. I came back home and helped my dad dig Cash's grave. We said our goodbyes and buried him. He made up a cute dog bone shaped tombstone out of leftover wood from his old workshop, and that was that. My mom came over that day, and we all went out to dinner for food. The food was the best I'd ever had. We gave Cash a little toast, and that was that. In the back of my mind, midnight, midnight. I spent another silent night staring at my clock, watching the numbers transform into the next every 60 seconds. The wait was agonizing. Each passing minute was like a minute removed from my life. That night, I was certain that I was going to die, and that I was trapped. They would have killed my parents if I tried anything. Killing Cash made that entirely too clear to me. 11.55. 11.56. 11.57. 11.58. 11.59. 11.60. 11.61. 11.62. 
11.59. I looked out the window. There they all were, side by side, shadows of people and the goat man in the center. All their eyes were on me. I looked at the clock. Midnight. I looked back out the window. They were all gone. They knew that. I knew that. They were coming out tonight. They killed my dog, and they threatened to kill me on the spot after I followed them into the woods. They knew I was broken. My spirits shattered, and that I was more afraid of what would happen if I didn't come out over what happened if I did. I grabbed the candle and walked into my backyard. The darkness was thick, thicker than usual, and the smell. Sour milk, spoiled lunch meat, blood, rot, decay, crap, puke, bile, death. My skin began to crawl, and a shiver took over me. Breathing became difficult. I could scarcely make out the forest before me. It wasn't just an entrance or a boundary. It was a living, breathing thing, and it was anticipating my every movement. As I took a step into my yard, a jolt of terror shot through me as I passed through the motion sensors and activated the backyard light. There was relief in light. Safety, at least. For a little while, anyways. I used my father's lighter to spark up the candle. I planted it into the cold, dewy grass and sat down nice and slowly, ready to cross my legs. I never sat in the full position that I was instructed to, because I was in the process of sitting down. I saw it. Two green eyes. Have you ever shined your light directly on an animal's face, way off in the distance in the dead of night? At a distance where it's too far to make out anything, what it looks like but not far enough for their eyes to not catch and reflect the light. This was exactly what I saw, except it seemed to be too high above the ground, higher than a coyote's height, and higher even than a human's height. It appeared to be pacing, back and forth. I could hear the leaves shuffling with each step it was taking, constantly coming in and out of existence due to the unseen trees eclipsing those glowing shards of light, those glaring eyes. They must have been reflecting off the backyard light, I could hear it breathing. It sounded painful to me. The air came out in short, sporadic breaths, and when it did, I felt the huffs of frozen air rank with the rotten stench go right through me. I don't remember how long it paced like this, never leaving the outskirts of the woods, never breaking eye contact with me. Every now and then it would stop and lower closer to the ground until its eyes were level with mine. It would remain in that position, like a cat low to the ground. Prepping to pounce on its prey, it would only stay in that position for ten seconds at a time before it rise back up and pace more. After I did this several times, I realized something was stopping it. The light. I was dumbstruck, frozen in place. My throat was so tight the air was barely getting in me, barely getting out of me. There was a powerful sense etched into my soul that any sudden movement would have sent this unspeakable thing into a frenzy at me, light or not. I didn't know if it was going to outright kill me here in the backyard, or if it was going to drag me into the woods and eat me alive there. I don't know what the relationship was between this and the psychopaths that ordered me out here. What I did know was that each moment it wasn't getting me, it was getting madder. I couldn't let it get me. I couldn't let it take me away. Theoretically, I was safe in the light, Except the thing was that this motion sensor light ran on a timer. I knew that the timer would soon run out, and when it did, the light would go, and nothing would stop it from getting me. With all my courage, all my willpower, I forced myself to stand up, letting out a hoarse breath. The eyes immediately stopped moving when it saw me stand. I couldn't tell you for certain, but I was almost positive they narrowed. The prospect of me escaping infuriated it to such a level that it began to stalk towards me. I could tell it was moving forward, threateningly, showing a willingness to brave the light. I took a step back and when I did, it took a swift step forward. I could almost see its shape, tall, thin, bony, too dark to distinguish any specific features, except, well, it had horns, large, curly, spiral-like horns, or at least it looked like it did. I don't remember running back to the house. I don't remember making it inside. I don't remember anything after the point where the light shut off. It was sudden, as if death had caught me. The timer was up. The light shut down and enveloped me in darkness, and I recall hearing it scream. It sounded like a child that denied its toy, 
Or was that me? When the light died, I freaking ran. It was hours later when I came to my senses. My dad holding me. My mom was there too. I was crying. Later, they would tell me that I was screaming. Don't let it get me! Over and over again. Don't let it get me! I don't remember myself. I never saw that creature again. With the goat mask again. The two old men in the pickup truck, I never saw them again either. That day forward, I always slept with the window shut. The next day, my dad and my mom took me outside to explain that nothing had happened. We saw displaced grass mixed with mud. We even saw gore marks in the trees. I thought this would be evidence enough to plead my case, but it didn't. My dad immediately laughed at me, telling me that he figured out the whole thing. I had an encounter with the deer. Those markings in the tree were from the antlers, and it charged at me because it felt threatened. This was such a convenient explanation that I wished to God that it was true, but I knew otherwise. Several weeks later, I heard that there was a missing person search that took place in those woods, but I myself haven't seen nor heard anything at the time. My dad and my therapist insisted that this knowledge would only enable my tendencies as a schizophrenic, so they stopped me from looking into it. Yes, I was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia disorder. They said I got it through my inability to cope with the divorce. They told me that I had retracted into a delusion because I felt responsible for the family's collapse and that my youthful, undeveloped mind couldn't process the guilt properly. That these cultists and their beasts were just agents of my personal symbolism. Something like that. For a while, I believed everything they told me. The lies felt safe. The lies were comfortable. Several years later, they would tell me that I had made a full recovery. It was an easy process, since I never had another encounter again. At that point in time, I was so angry, I just told them what they wanted to hear. When I became old enough, I severed all ties with my parents, and I moved out of state. Once I was on my own, I looked into the town archives and researched as much information as I could about that era, when I was nine. The missing person report. The manhood in those woods lasted several days, and all they found was one man. He was torn apart, his limbs removed, his organs missing. They found that he was wearing a peculiar mask, the head of a ram, but its innards were carefully carved and hollowed to fit over a human's head. When they removed the helmet, they saw that he had died with the expression of absolute horror. I took pleasure in that. I would like to believe that these men were cultists, that they were attempting to appease some unseen, unnamed god, a god that absolutely should not have existed. A god that had no right to walk among men. And during that process, their attempts to appease it, I had botched their ritual by breaking an important piece of the process. The doll. And in their attempt to salvage it, they forced me into offering myself up as a sacrifice to it. But it failed to do whatever it was going to do to me that night, destroying the whole operation. I would prefer to believe that, in the name of vengeance, this angry thing turned on its own worshipper killing them all and dragging them back all to wherever it came from. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. There is just one thing I still couldn't figure out. Why is that, no matter where I go, when I'm all alone in the quiet place in the dead of night? Why can I still hear them chanting that unholy sermon that I heard so long ago in the woods when I was nine?